This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Darwin's Legacy, our course in honor of the Darwin Bicentenary on the Impact of Evolutionary Thinking. I want to begin with just a couple of words, a few words about last week when we had a double lecture, which is unusual. We won't be doing double lectures very often on Charles Darwin, the man, the myth, and the momentous discoveries. Professor Bob Siegel started us off, as you'll remember, with a sweeping and often humorous look at Darwin the man, what he did and didn't do. Among the other fascinating insights that Bob reviewed for us, he pointed out that Darwin spent more time studying barnacles than he did on the entire voyage of the Beagle. That Darwin was more an authority on insectivorous plants than on the finches of Galapagos that were named for him. He barely studied the finches really at all. Bob pointed out that Darwin was certainly not the first person to suggest that species evolve or change over time. Indeed, uh, his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, wrote prose as well as poetry to that effect, uh, not to mention Lamarck and Buffon before him. Bob noted that Darwin spent barely one one-thousandth of his life in Galapagos and yet saw it, quote, as origin of all my views. I then followed Bob with a look at Darwin's data, especially what he saw and collected in that short period uh, in Galapagos during the Beagle voyage and how it influenced his subsequent thinking. I argued that Darwin was a creationist the full length of the Beagle voyage and while he did appreciate the differences he saw in some species, notably the mockingbirds of the different islands of Galapagos, he concluded, quote, I suspect they must be only varieties and not the endemic species that we know them to be today. That suspicion of varieties was wrong, but it only was corrected after the Beagle returned to England in 1836. In 1837, British ornithologist John Gould persuaded Darwin that the mockingbirds were indeed distinct species, as were the 13 species of finches we looked at last time, all new to zoology. Thomas Bell confirmed that the tortoises were really endemic to Galapagos and not brought by pirates, as Darwin had thought. And Joseph Hooker uh, confirmed that Darwin's land plant species from Galapagos varied by island. Hence, it was the Galapagos that convinced Darwin of evolution, and he drew up the first tree of life in 1837. Another year passed before he read Malthus, as we said last week, and came up with the idea of natural selection from the struggle for existence. And we said last time that Darwin then left us with two indelible messages. First, organisms on Earth were not separately created, but all had evolved or descended with modification from one common source. Secondly, natural selection, the preservation of features by virtue of their survival and reproductive advantage was the main but not exclusive means in that modification. When Darwin told his friends about the idea of natural selection, one of them, the biologist Thomas Henry Huxley, remarked famously how extremely stupid not to have thought of that. Tonight we turn to the social repercussions of Darwin's discovery of evolution by natural selection and particularly to the tension with religion in the creation-evolution controversy. In the United States, it seems like the creation-evolution controversy always comes quickly to the surface whenever discussing Darwin's legacy. So the course planning committee felt like we should address this matter right up front at the beginning of the class. So I'm very pleased to introduce tonight Dr. Eugenie Scott, author of our course book, The Evolution versus Creation, an Introduction, who is a leading authority and researcher on this topic. Since 1987, Dr. Scott has been the executive director of the National Center for Science Education, NCSE, a pro-evolution nonprofit uh, dedicated to science education and has members in every state. You probably know NCSE from its lovely bumper stickers, which you see all over Palo Alto. Evolutionists do it with increasing complexity. <laughs> or honk if you understand the theory of punctuated equilibrium. We'll be talking about that with Niles Eldridge, to be sure. 
Dr. Scott holds a PhD in biological anthropology from the University of Missouri, where her research uh, was in medical anthropology and skeletal biology. She's taught at the University of Kentucky, the University of Colorado, and has received a slew of honorary Doctor of Science degrees from McGill, Ohio State, and many other universities. In April of this year, 2008, she was awarded the University of California San Francisco Medal, their highest honor. She's not only author of our reading, but she's also the co-editor with Glenn Branch of Not in Our Classrooms, Why Intelligent Design is Wrong for Our Schools. She served as chair of the Ethics Committee of the American Anthropological Association, as president of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists, and has chaired both the anthropology and education sections of the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Scott is nationally recognized as a proponent of church-state separation and serves on the National Advisory Council of Americans United for the Separation of Church and State and the American Civil Liberties Union. She has consulted with the National Academy of Sciences, several state departments of education, and legal staffs in both the United States and Australia. I thought it would be instructive to mention one of my personal favorites of her long list of publications. It's called Countering Creationism with Drive-By Science, published in the General Anthropology Newsletter in the fall of 2006. In it, Dr. Scott focuses on the special problem of discussing evolution when creationism comes up with a neighbor over the back fence, at a cocktail party, or in the checkout line at the grocery store. I especially like three lessons from her paper that I thought would be fun to share. Jeannie, I try to use them myself most of the time. Number one, focus on evolution as the proposition of common ancestry. The statement that organisms are related by descent in one grand system. Forget esoteric definitions like evolution is a change in gene frequency in populations. People don't understand gene frequencies. We hardly understand what a gene is. Second, ask questions in such a context. Try not to expound at length on what you think. Why do you think giraffes have the same number of neck bones we have, you might ask? Why do you think we have a coccyx? That's a tailbone. One that I've found works pretty well. Why do you think we have so many back problems? And a real conversation provoker is why do males have nipples? Any of those will start a conversation that is going to be more interesting than simply expounding. And thirdly, be prepared for the theory question. People will say, oh, evolution, that's just a theory. To which Jeannie says one should reply, yes, just like gravity is a theory. She urges us to think of evolution as an explanation and to avoid entirely the word fact. When your neighbor hears you call evolution a fact, they will think to themselves, dogmatic scientist, Stay and say, say instead, says Jeannie, we accept it as an explanation for the unity and diversity of life. Focus on explanation rather than fact. Anyone with such clear practical sense on such a difficult subject is someone we should listen to and learn from. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eugenie Scott. You know, drive-by science is what I do. I'm here for an hour, I'm going to say some things, then I'm going to disappear, and, and your faculty members have to mop up afterwards. So it's kind of a good deal for me, I guess, when you come right down to it. Science and religion. Probably not quite what you think it is, because um, people have a lot of confusion about what science is, and they really have a lot of confusions about what religion is. I'm going to start off by talking about epistemology. See, I can use big words with Stanford students, can I? Um, ways of knowing. And any philosopher of science in the audience is, you start cringing now because what I'm going to do is simplify it to a, a most disreputable extent. But that's what I have to do. Um, I'm going to collapse a whole uh, semester's work of discussion about ways of knowing into basically three. And obviously, I'm going to, there's a procrustean bed going on here. One way of knowing is science. 
And since I'm going to be talking about that most, I'm going to talk about the other two and then come back to science. Another way of knowing is reference to personal states of being or insight. Uh, one of the most familiar um, examples of this way of knowing is a drug-induced state, which obviously none of you would know anything about whatsoever, but which sometimes tribal populations will engage in. Uh, they, the Yanomamo Indians in, um, in uh, Venezuela will take hallucinogenic snuff, and the spirits from the forest will, will inhabit them, and they'll receive knowledge from the spirits about hunting or about the next tribe over whom they are uh, at warfare with or whatever. Um, Drug-induced states, um, a, a vision quest of a Plains Indian uh, individual back in the 1800s, 1700s, uh, where they would put themselves through conditions of great privation to uh, basically generate hallucinations. And at that point, the gods of the crow were the Sue would then inhabit them and give them uh, messages. They'd learn what their personal totem was and so forth and so on. And these kinds of personal uh, insight or, or ways of knowing, ways of getting information based upon your individual experience can be extremely powerful to the individual. But they're not very persuasive to people either not from your culture or somebody from your culture who hasn't had that experience. I'm sure that the experience of a Yanomamo Indian uh, of being f uh, filled with uh, the forest spirits is going to be very unpersuasive to an, uh, a fundamentalist Christian. But the experience of a fundamentalist Christian of being filled with the spirit of God and uh, therefore gaining insight into a uh, variety of things is not going to be very persuasive either to the Yanomamo Indian or even to a Catholic whose tradition does not include those kinds of experiences. So this way of knowing tends to be very idiosyncratic and not very persuasive to other people. Another way of knowing is authority. And, you know, we live in the Bay Area, right? So we see all the question authority signs, right? And I always want to get out a magic marker whenever I see one of those bumper stickers and you know, question authority, but stop at stop signs. There, there's, authority kind of takes a bad rap in, in the Bay Area, but you know, authority isn't all that bad. And your first authority, obviously, is your parents. Um, those of you sitting in the back of the room, who are the undergraduates, I understand, are moving away from that right now, but it is, it is always true that your parents are right. Just remember that. <laughs> and, and you can sort of see why it would be adaptive, really, uh, for, for kind of instant obedience uh, for a parent for a very young child. Uh, when mom says, get out of the street, here comes the car, that's not greatly different from a Pleistocene mom saying, don't tease the saber tooth. There is definitely adaptive value to following what mom says to do. And most of the things that we know we do take on authority, by and large, even many things that we know through science. When, when Steve Weinberg talks about quarks, I accept his authority. Okay. But it's not quite the same thing as mom's authority in telling you not to run into the street or something. I know that if I really wanted to, I could spend years and years studying the mathematics and understand why Steve Weinberg, the Nobel laureate, says what he says about quarks. I'm disinclined to do that, though, because my palms sweat at the thought of a fraction. So I tend not to you know, want to, to uh, demonstrate to myself that what Weinberg says about quarks is correct. But I know that I can talk to other physicists who have spent the time, and so you know, I know that there's, there's a way of, of verifying the statements made in science. So it's not quite the same sort of authoritarianism as um, what we usually consider in this particular way of knowing of authority. I want to call your attention to one particular kind of authority, which is revelation. Revelation is authority that is revealed to the person, a uh, member of the culture, from a sacred source. And uh, many, many religions receive knowledge uh, through authorities. Um, the um, oracle at um, uh, uh, Delphi received, uh, the Delphic oracle received uh, messages from Apollo and gave them to the people who came to uh, find out what they should do about things. Um, 
The um, Muslims believe that the Quran was inspired, uh, that Muhammad was inspired by God to write the Quran. Um, Christians believe that the uh, Bible, and especially the New Testament, was inspired um, by God directly to the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the other people who set down these, uh, these stories. Again, Revelation tends to be fairly culture-bound. What is a, a um, uh, acceptable revelation uh, from a sacred source to one individual is not necessarily acceptable to another. Modern day um, conservative Christians are not going to accept the Delphic Oracle as a source of knowledge of, by revelation, nor are they likely to accept um, Mohammed as a uh, source of uh, revealed truth. Uh, similarly, uh, other people will have other interpretations as well. So the problem with personal states of knowledge or insight or authoritarian ways of knowing is that they tend not to be persuasive to others. I want to talk now about science. Because science is, I mean, I'm tossing logic in here, and yes, logic is really separate from science, but science uses logic, and I'm simplifying, so that's, you know, think logic as well as science. Let me talk a little bit about what science is. Now, you may be kind of surprised to hear me describe science as a limited way of knowing. But science is a limited way of knowing in two ways. It's limited because all we're trying to explain is the natural world. That's one limitation. The second limitation, in my view, is that we are limited to using natural processes or mechanisms. That gives us a lot to do, because there's a lot in the natural world that we can attempt to explain, and we have a great deal to learn about the processes and, and history of the planet and so forth. Uh, but still, that leaves out a lot of things that human beings might be interested in knowing more about. The important component of science, in my opinion, is that a scientific way of knowing, a scientific explanation, is one that tests itself against the natural world. The big idea in science is really testing of knowledge. Let's talk a little bit about testing, because when people think of tests, they think of experiment, right? And I tend not to use the word experiment, aren't these awful pictures? Because when you use the word experiment, this is the kind of image that people get. Somebody sitting in the laboratory pouring something from one beaker to another. I like to use the word testing, an experiment, a direct experiment like these people are doing on the, uh, on the, in the picture, that's one kind of test, but there's a lot of different ways of testing an explanation. These archaeologists can be testing their explanations in a field setting. Um, these biologists sitting in a blind making observations of ducks can be testing a hypothesis. You don't have to control all of the variables. You don't have to do your testing in a laboratory to still be testing an explanation. When we're talking about testing explanations, we're talking about holding constant certain variables and uh, looking at what's left so that you can see whether your explanation really does explain what it is you're trying to explain. Most Americans don't understand that. That's kind of sad. Let me give you an example. Every two years, the National um, Research Board publishes a booklet called Science and Engineering Indicators. And they ask, um, it's, it's a bunch of statistics about science and engineering. And there, there's also a chapter, it's the only one I ever read, about um, understanding of science. What is the American understanding of various scientific concepts and also understanding of science as a way of knowing, of the methodology of science. And unfortunately, only about a third of Americans get the nature of science right. Uh, the correct answer is that science has to do with the testing of explanations or systematic comparison or, or, or uh, experimentation. People often understand a concept but yet can't exactly recall a definition, so the good folks at the uh, National Research Board have uh, tried to help folks out by giving them an example. And here's the example. It has to do with testing a blood pressure medicine. And you have a blood pressure medicine, you want to know if it's efficacious. One way of testing it would be to give the drug to a thousand people and then measure how many have decreased blood pressure. A second way, give the 
drug to 500 people with high blood pressure, don't give the, blood, the drug to another 500 people with high blood pressure, and then measure to see how many have lowered blood pressure. Okay, boys and girls. How many of you think that statement number one is a good scientific test? Oh, you're cautious, aren't you? How many think that statement number two is a better way of testing it? Well, congratulations, because you did better than 43% of your fellow citizens, each of whom, each of whom I uh, uh, will call to your attention has one vote, just like you, but that's another issue. Um, yeah, we don't really understand the idea of testing. Let's talk a little bit about testing, because, like I say, Americans don't, you know, don't really have the idea of testing explanations. To me, one of, the, one of the most important components of science is being able to ask, is there another explanation? Let's say that you have a friend who is a dowser. He claims that he can find water using a forked stick. He's holding his dowsing rod there. He claims that there are mystical forces that come from the water up through the dowsing rod which he can feel and therefore he can find water. A lot of people think that you can find water using a forked stick or maybe some people can find water. Do you think this man will find water? <laughs> Is there another explanation? <laughs> In fact, I think he's about to fall into a puddle uh, be before he... There may be many reasons why old Uncle Fred on the next hollow over is able to find water. Maybe he's lived in this uh, uh, valley for a long time and he kind of subliminally knows where water is likely to be found. It may be that he lives in a place like these English dowsers where wherever you dig, you're gonna find water. That, that's a wonderful picture because it's after a rain, but they're out there just very enthusiastically. If any of you are teachers, or are thinking of becoming teachers, you can have a wonderful lesson with your students using something like dowsing and actually testing whether or not dowsing works. And if this was an actual class, I would go through this with you. Um, in the meantime, there's a wonderful site from the Australian Skeptics, which I will call to your attention, where all of this is described, and it's really a lot of fun. Uh, this is the um, Australian Dowsing Association. These are all people who are convinced that they can find water with a forked stick. And so the Australian Skeptics set up a test. They took these plastic bottles, which I believe is there, one is, one is there, right there. And some of these plastic bottles had water and some of them did not have water and the plastic bottles were, all, were covered up and the dowsers would go around and see you know, whether they could detect which of these covered plastic bottles had water and which did not. Um, the tendency is to count the hits and forget the misses, so that's why you have to do this in an organized fashion, controlling for certain variables. If you were a class of mine, I would lead you to um, understanding the principle of blinding, which is that the dowsers can't know in advance which bottles have the water. <laughs> You'd be surprised how useful that is when you're setting up a test. And then I would lead the students to understand about double blinding. And that is that the guy with the check sheet who is writing down whether or not dowser A and, or dowser B selects the proper, um, or what, I should say, not proper one, whether the dowsers select um, or don't select a particular um, uh, uh, bottle, um, that person also can't know where the bottles are. Can you think why that would be so? Yeah, you could inadvertently cue. <gasps> You're getting close. Um, sixth graders are wonderful to do this with because they, they totally clue they, they, they totally cue in the, uh, the the investigators, and that's how you teach them about double blinding. At any rate. There's all kinds of things that you would want to do to make this a fair test. The idea is controlling variables. You want to have not just the um, just the water bottles. Um, uh, watered and unwatered because the, the bottles with water are going to sink deeper into the grass so you have to put something in the other bottles as well that's of equal weight. You know, you can think about, you can brainstorm about all the things you'd have to control to make this a really good study. And then of course in double blinding. 
And of course, when you do that, you find that the dowsers don't find water any more frequently than expected by chance, which is a fun thing. So uh, testing is, is a very, very important component of science. In addition to testing, another very important part of science is inference. And I want to talk about inference because people kind of look at inference as if it's a lower form of science, so to speak. Ken Ham, the um, uh, Australian actually, who runs Answers in Genesis, an important creationist ministry in northern uh, Kentucky, has a mantra that he teaches students to, uh, to say to their teachers, were you there? The idea being that unless you are directly observing something, well, you're just making an inference, and inferences are a lower form of science. Actually, all really good science is done through inference, and you use inference all the time. Let us take an example. Here is a picture. This picture shows a number of things. It shows a highway, it shows a highway department stripe, it shows a cow pie, it shows a tire track. Now let me break this down for you a little bit because it's kind of hard to see in that picture. There's the road, there's the cow pie, there's the highway department stripe, there is more cow pie, and then there is a tire track on top of the cow pie. Now, were you there? Well, no. We weren't there to see this um, event happen that produced this particular interesting layering. But we can use logical inference, we can use observations and logical inference from those observations to come up with a pretty reasonable explanation for how this sequence of items got to be there in this particular order. Now, you might hypothesize, well, first of all, first of all, how many of you think the tire track came first? That's the beginning of inference, right? Obviously, the road came first, because that's on the bottom. This is the same principle that geologists use when they're interpreting something like the Tapitz Formation in Grand Canyon. In geology, there's a principle called superposition, which is the stuff on the bottom is older than the stuff on top. That is an inference. Nobody was there to observe the Tapete sandstone being laid down. But you can make a very logical inference about which are the older strata and the younger strata, unless you have some very good reasons not to. So you would come up with, I think, a fairly reasonable um, explanation. Now, in science, you always want to ask, is there another explanation? Well, possibly, yes. Well, maybe an astronaut from outer space came in. Maybe an extraterrestrial came in and arranged the cow pie and the stripes and the tire track uh, as we see them. Well, that's possible. I mean, after all, maybe not Marvin the Martian, but an extraterrestrial would at least be a material cause, right? Uh, this is a, this is a, you know, if ex extraterrestrials exist, then they are, are creatures of matter and energy. And if an extraterrestrial came down to produce this sequence, then we might assume that there would be some evidence of this. And there is no evidence of this, and it's much less likely that an astronaut came in to make this um, display than you just had a really lazy highway department uh, who, when they came and striped the road, didn't bother scraping off the cow pie, but just striped right on over it and proceeded on down the, down the road. Another uh, equally reasonable hypothesis would be it was an inobservant highway uh, striping uh, car. But either lazy or inobservant, much more likely than an extraterrestrial who uh, came from a civilization we don't even know about, very, very far away with technology that we can't dream of, very unlikely. What about Thor? <laughs> Maybe Thor came in and built this sequence. Well, you know, we can't test that. Because the nice thing about being a god is that you are all powerful. And Thor could have come in and arranged the cow pie and the stripes exactly like we see them and leave no evidence whatsoever because gods, of course, are immortal and omnipotent and, and uh, they wouldn't have to leave the tracks of the uh, uh, spaceship, for example, like a, a material uh, producer would. So we don't use extra, um, we don't use supernatural explanations in science. We don't, use ex we don't use supernatural explanations because there's no way that we can hold constant a supernatural power, 
And, that's, and if science is about testing and holding constant variables, we have to just leave supernatural explanations like Thor out. So inference is a very basic way that we make decisions. And this is a very simple inference, obviously, but we make inferences about things all the time. Evolution is an inference. Evolution is the inference that living things have descended with modification from common ancestors. And we make this inference based upon a huge range of information, including the fact that living creatures form this hierarchical distribution. Bears and dogs look more like each other than they look like lions, because bears and dogs shared a common ancestor with each other more recently than they shared a common ancestor with lions. Okay? This is the way the tree of life falls out in this hierarchical fashion. Evolution generates hierarchy. The only explanation that makes sense of this kind of distribution of similarities and differences is common ancestry. But it's an inference. It's not an observation. It happens to be a very powerful inference, supported not just by uh, the, the, the tree of life, but by anatomy, by behavior, by other homologies, biochemistry, embryology, and so forth. Descent with modification is the one explanation that makes sense of a huge, huge amount of biology. And that is why it is a very, very powerful and a very solid explanation. Now, I'm not going to talk any more about the methods of science. Let me talk a little bit about the content of science. And here I want to steal a very good uh, diagram from my friend Jim Treffel, who is a physicist who does some very good writing uh, for the public on, on, the nature, on science. He talks about the content of science forming three concentric circles. In the middle, uh, the, the, the core, as it were, the, the first concentric circle, are the consists of the core ideas of science. These are the ideas that are well tested, that are well accepted. We've um, tested them so much, we really have a lot of confidence in them. It may not be true that the planets go around the sun, but it's worked really well for a long time. It's not an observation. Nobody has sat out in space and watched the planets, observed the planets go around the sun. Heliocentrism is an inference, just like common ancestry. Most of the really good ideas in science are inferences, by the way. So things like heliocentrism, things like evolution, um, plate tectonics, those are core ideas of science. They, they can change, but in general, we have a lot of confidence in them because they've held up for so long. Around the core ideas of science is the scientific frontier. Now, the scientists at Stanford and other universities and in um, um, biotech firms and engineering firms around the country, they are the ones making the discoveries. Uh, they are the ones working, where they work is on the frontier of science. And some of these frontier ideas that they are testing and evaluating will go into the core. Many of them, most of them will not. You have a whole lot, of more, whole lot more ideas than you have good ideas, unfortunately. And you know, it takes a lot to really establish one of these core ideas of science. Jim Treffel also talks about the fringe as being the ideas that are really out there that professional scientists really aren't spending any time on. And um, this is where this is the realm of pseudoscience, uh, creation science, and so forth would fit into the fringe area of science. Occasionally, a fringe idea becomes a frontier idea, becomes a core idea, but not very often. There's a reason why fringe ideas are fringe. It's because they don't help us understand nature, and that's why scientists don't spend any time on them. When we look at evolution, evolution, the big idea of evolution is, of course, this idea of common descent, common ancestry. We also look at two other components of evolution in evolutionary biology, the mechanisms or factors of effecting, bringing about evolution, natural selection being the most important one, but there's other factors as well. And we also look at the patterns that evolution takes, how the tree of life has branched through time. There's a little thing on birdie evolution there. Common ancestry is a core idea of science. The scientific community at Stanford and elsewhere is not arguing over whether living things descended with modification from common ancestors. That's a done deal. That's a core idea of science. It works so well. It's tested all the time. We just 
work from there and, and nobody's really actively testing that. Although it's possible it could be wrong. But basically, nobody's really asking whether common ancestry happened. The patterns and process of evolution, that's the frontier areas of science. The reason I, I make this distinction is that it's a useful one in, in dealing with a lot of the anti-evolution uh, sentiments that we find in our country today. Many creationists will look at arguments among scientists about the process of evolution or the patterns of evolution and treat them as if they are arguments against the core idea of evolution of common ancestry. This is a category error. Actually, one of the things that you'll be doing in this class, I suspect, is looking at the evidence that Darwin had for common ancestry, that's his big idea, the evidence that Darwin assembled for natural selection, which was his prime mechanism of evolution, two different ideas here. Darwin didn't know very much about the fossil record. The fossil record was not nearly as well known in his day as it is in our day. And to demonstrate common ancestry requires a completely different set of data and observations and theory than to demonstrate a mechanism of evolution. Think about that historically. Darwin was much easier, much more easily able to convince his contemporaries that common ancestry had taken place than he was able to convince them of the mechanism of natural selection. That took until the 20th century, until we knew more about heredity, before natural selection really made a lot of sense as the prime mover of evolution. So these are two conceptually different things, as is the fossil record, as is the pattern of evolution, which we construct independent of whether natural selection or some other mechanism caused it. It doesn't matter if you're trying to decide whether birds are dinosaurs, whether this was the result of natural selection or not. These are independent areas of study. And that is why creationists are on very thin ice when they are trying to claim that arguments among scientists about the pattern and process are really arguments among scientists, non-existent arguments among scientists about the big idea of evolution. Okay, let me talk a little bit about assumptions, because I've been stressing testing and inference, talked a little bit about the um, content of science. A lot of people don't think that science really has assumptions, but science does, just like religion does. But they're kind of different. By assumptions, I mean first principles, things that are just assumed in science and not actually tested themselves. We assume in science that there is an objective reality outside of the individual. I find this a philosophically really boring question myself. I don't really think I made you all up five minutes ago. I think you are really real. And I'm real. See? I'm real. <laughs> a second assumption that we make is the universe operates according to regularities. That if today water is hydrogen and oxygen, tomorrow it'll be hydrogen and oxygen. Some of the physicists are saying, eh, maybe this is not quite the case in the multiverse, but let's just stick with our own verse. Okay, let's just stick with our own universe. What we know so far is that it appears to be the case that the universe operates according to regularities. A third assumption that I think most scientists make is that human beings are capable of understanding those regularities. But I think we have to have a caveat here because it may be that, as J.B.S. Haldane once said, the universe is queerer than we can understand. There may be things that we really cannot understand. Let, let me give you a, 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 a little story to try to illustrate that. This is my goldfish. Actually, it isn't. It's one I stole from Google uh, pictures, but whatever. This is my, pretend this is my goldfish, and, and I have the, mo the world's most brilliant goldfish. This goldfish is so smart that when I come up to the tank, the fish will swim to the top of the uh, tank to be fed. When my husband comes up to the tank, the fish ignores him because he never feeds the fish. Hey, for a goldfish, this is brilliance. Th th this is an Einstein of goldfish, okay? Now, here we are in California. One day, 30,000 feet below the surface of my house, a wave of motion starts coming up through the rocks and goes into the uh, basement of my house and causes the water to slosh out of the goldfish bowl. 
An earthquake is a perfectly natural event. But there's no way that my goldfish has got the neurons to understand an earthquake. Right? No matter if this is the Einstein of goldfish, nonetheless, a goldfish doesn't have the neurons to really understand what an earthquake is, no matter how brilliant. Maybe we are like the goldfish in some respects. Maybe there are things in our universe that we just don't have the neurons to understand. And maybe, you know, maybe some of those things um, have been explained by human beings over time. Uh, since the Pleistocene, when we started developing culture. Maybe some of those things have been explained um, through mystical uh, explanations or religious explanations. Possibly, like an earthquake, they have a natural explanation. Just something to think about. Now, I've asked you to think like a scientist. Now I want you to think like an anthropologist. We're going to talk about religion now. When you say religion to most Americans, this is what they think. They think about our country, and they think about Christianity. But I want you to think more like an anthropologist when I talk about religion. I want you to think not just about Christianity, even though that is the most common religion in the United States. I want you to think not even about the Middle Eastern monotheisms, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. I want you to think not even about world religions, uh, not even Shinto and Confucianism and Buddhism and so forth. I want you to think beyond, I want you to think about the broadest possible definition of religion that you have, which would include such things as tribal religions. I want you to think with me, what definition of religion can we come up with that would suit world religions, tribal religions, perhaps non-existent religions, religions that are not practiced anymore, ancient Maya, ancient Norse, whatever. What definition can we come up with that will encompass all of the different ways that human beings have, that human beings have referred to as religion? And we're going to walk through this because it, it is not an easy thing. I thought about it for a long time and you may not agree with me. I would like to define religion as a set of rules and beliefs that people have about a non-material reality. And that picture is just because it's pretty. Uh, all of those things in that picture are material. Clouds, sky, sunlight. Those are all aspects of matter and energy. That's what we mean by the material world. Religion, to me, as an anthropologist, trying to find a, a definition that would suit everything from world religions to tribal religions, this definition the one, the one component that all religions seem to have in common is a concept of a reality other than the matter and energy reality in which we live. This can be in the, in the Abrahamic faiths, heaven and hell. Uh, the ancient Norse had Valhalla. Uh, the Trobriand Islanders had, the, the land, had where the ancestor spirits live. Something that was, could be experienced different from the world that we live in today. Uh, in some cases it was visualized as a place like the Elysian fields of the Greeks. In some cases it was visualized as something that was sort of parallel and possibly even interacting with the present world, uh, the material world, but was unseen and you had to use special rituals in order to, uh, to, to access it, as in some animistic religions. What are the characteristics of religion then? Well, belief in supernatural powers certainly is a common uh, belief of religions. Not all, though. Not all. The belief that truth is revealed from these sacred sources. Uh, the Bible is considered a book of revealed truth, at least in part, um, by most uh, Christians and, and Abrahamic faiths. And also the idea of, of mystical, personal states of being are considered important are considered to be a form of knowledge, differently interpreted. Most religions have the idea of a sense of the sacred in the Catholic communion, uh, transubstantiation, the wine becomes the blood of Christ, the wafer becomes the body of Christ. Feelings of awe are common in religion. 
although what generates the awe is very definitely religion or culturally specific. And quite commonly, religion involves belief in an afterlife, but not all. Not all religions believe in an afterlife. Many religions have a component of ethics and morals to their um, components. Is it moral to kill? Uh, what, is, what is proper behavior within the group versus outside of the group, us versus them? How shall we treat one another? The tablets of Moses, um, the horrors of the Holocaust. Many times religion does pronounce on morals and ethics, but not all. There are human societies in which moral behavior, proper behavior, ethical behavior is determined by tradition rather than by revelation. So there's a lot of, of variation out there in, in how religion is worked out in different human societies. Let's do a little comparison between science and religion. Uh, I mentioned um, some of these things. I didn't actually mention the idea of logic and empirical evidence, but I would say yes. Many religions do include the world of, of the um, uh, the material world and logic as part of their knowledge as well as revelation. Obviously the Catholic Church has been, uh, has, has had very long traditions for this. Revelation, obviously, that goes in the religion column. Myster mystical or personal states of being, certainly that would also be the case. Let's take a look at science for these same categories. Logical empirical evidence, yes, that's common to both. Revelation, no. You do not get your paper published in Science Magazine because you reported that you had this great dream the other night. You get your paper published in Science because you went out and tested the idea that came from that dream. So mystical and personal states of being and revelation are not considered part of science. Let's take a look at some other characteristics. Supernatural powers intervene in the world. Most religions believe that this is possible. Belief in a non-material world, well, that's my definition of religion, so yes, we'll say this is correct. Belief in spiritual beings, yes, this is certainly something that is common to religion. Remember, think beyond just the Abrahamic religions that you're most familiar with. Think anthropologically now. Science, well, science has to assume that supernatural powers don't intervene. But that's not the same thing as saying science rejects all possibilities of supernatural powers. Remember, the big idea of science is testing. The big idea of testing is holding constant certain variables. If you've got supernatural powers, you can't hold them constant, so you just have to set them aside. That's why I would say for this cell, under the science column, science just has to assume that supernatural powers aren't out there messing up the experiment. The two uh, plots of corn grew about the same, not because God wanted them to, but because the fertilizer, the fertilizer you put on the one really wasn't a very good fertilizer. The problem with using supernatural explanations is that any result of your experiment is compatible with the actions of God or the supernatural uh, uh, being. So we just have to leave it aside when we're talking about science. Belief in a non-material world, science doesn't have an opinion. Science, remember, is limited to studying the natural world and explaining it with natural processes. Belief in spiritual be beings, similarly, science per se has no opinion in this matter. You'll get a very different uh, point of view, by the way, when you come to hear Dan Dennett's talk. Um, belief in an afterlife, most religions do believe in an afterlife. Concern with morals, ethics, and um, evil, yes, certainly, most Religions, not all, but most religions have this. A sense of awe, of mystery, a sense of the sacred, certainly those are characteristics of religion. How about science? Science has no opinion on an afterlife. If there is an afterlife, it's not something science can study, because science studies the natural world using natural causes. It's outside of the natural world. It's not part of a scientist's job description. Is science per se concerned with evil ethics and morals? No. Are scientists, oh yeah, I'm very concerned with, with morals and ethics and things like that I, as a person, as a human being, as a member of our society. Wearing a scientist hat, eh, not especially. Scientists don't obs obsess over whether it is moral for a coyote to kill chickens, okay? That's just not a question that comes up in science, right? So science itself 
doesn't have a, a, a dog in this particular fight. A sense of awe of mystery and the sacred. Science really doesn't have an opinion here. Scientists may indeed have a feeling of awe. Every time I go down Grand Canyon and I see that that canyon with the tapetes there and all the other wonderful uh, things in the Grand Canyon, my jaw drops to the bottom of the raft and I just sit there. It's just fabulous. But that doesn't have anything to do with explaining the depositional sequence that laid down the tapetes, right? There's a difference between science as a way of knowing and what scientists do. I would want to make that, ex I, I just want to underscore that. Science as a way of knowing is limited to just explaining the natural world, just using natural processes. Let's look a little bit about religion in the United States. These data come from a very large study from the City University of New York, something like you know, 100,000 uh, telephone interviews. It's just a massive study, uh, very, very reliable. In the United States, approximately 76.5% of Americans identify themselves as Christians, about 1.3% as Jews, about 14% identify themselves as having no religion, and then the rest is uh, minor religions. If we just take that Christian group, we can break that into two components. Born-again Christians, which is about 30%, and mainstream or mainline Christians, which is about 46%. Now these numbers you know, are plus or minus uh, because terms like evangelical, terms like fundamentalist, terms like Pentecostal are, are very difficult to define. In general, a born-again Christian is someone who has a personal relationship with God. Uh, salvation is directly mediated through Jesus, and the Bible is true. It is at least inerrant, and most born-again Christians believe that the Bible is, um, should be taken literally as much as possible. Given this, a um, very large percentage of conservative Christians, it is perhaps not a big surprise that the topic of evolution generates uh, a lot of difficulty. I want to put one idea aside right away, which is very common in the consideration of science and religion, and that is that scientists are all a bunch of atheists. A recent study by Eklund and Scheidel in Social Problems last year made a survey of scientists, of natural scientists and social scientists at elite institutions. Probably some of the colleagues here were, uh, uh, received the questionnaire. Obviously, this is much too small to see, uh, but the statement, I do not believe in God, I'm going to call your attention to the overall um, average for natural sciences, the overall average for social sciences, and just let me reprint that information for you here. Natural scientists, 37.6% uh, declare themselves atheists, about 29% declare themselves agnostics, about 32% declare themselves believers, and there's a gradation of belief from very sure to probably. Uh, social scientists had a slightly higher percentage of uh, acceptance of religion, slightly lower incident of atheism. Now, clearly, when you look at those, uh, that, the, the data from the Cooney study, Scientists, natural scientists, or um, uh, social scientists have a lower frequency of acceptance of God, of, of belief. Uh, fewer of them are religious than the population as a whole, but by no means is it zero percent. And this is, a, this is a common misunderstanding, even on many campuses. Uh, just assume that uh, at least 30, you know, at least um, um, three out of ten of your colleagues are going to be believers if you're at a, an elite institution. If you go to a community college or four-year college, the percentage is higher. And there's all kinds of interesting sociological reasons. But I just wanted to point out the fact that scientists uh, are people of faith. There are scientists have, are believers and they're not believers. They have um, a full range of belief from conservative Christianity to um, uh, liberalism, agnosticism, and so forth. It is not true that all scientists are atheists. That should be obvious, but it isn't to many Americans. But we do have a real problem in the United States with the acceptance of evolution. In this study by Miller and colleagues published a couple of years ago, the question was asked of Americans as well as 32 other nations, humans evolved from earlier forms of animals, true or false? The blue is true, the yellow is don't know, the red is false. And I know you're looking for the United States, aren't you? We beat Turkey! 
we might aspire to a little higher than that in terms of cultural literacy, but it is certainly the case that there is a movement out there that is very definitely opposing evolution and believes that evolution is a seriously um, injurious idea to American society. These um, bumper stickers come from a movement called Creation Science, which was founded largely by Henry Morris back in the 1960s and still continues very successfully today. Scientific creationism or creation science is basically the Christian doctrine of special creationism, but with the additional claim that there is scientific evidence to support these ideas. In special creationism, the idea is that God creates, but all Christians believe that, it's how God creates. And special creationism is the idea that God creates everything in its present form. And the kinds of organisms, plants and animals, are created with limited genetic variation. The creationist view is a lawn rather than a tree. Each blade of grass is a separate creation. The blades of grass don't come together like the branches of a tree. Um, the, there can be variation within the kind, but the kinds are separate independent creations. And usually everything is created at one time. That's the most common form of creationism. The um, answers, and, and the idea that everything is created in its present form is the most important component of special creationism, as it is played out in both traditional creation science and in intelligent design, which we can talk about later. At the Answers in Genesis Museum in Florence, Kentucky, uh, you can find a lot of evidence for this. Uh, they believe that every creature was created at the same time during the six creation days of Genesis. Therefore, extinct animals like dinosaurs and mammoths coexisted with human beings. Uh, Noah's flood was an actual uh, historical event, and all of the uh, land animals, um, seven pairs of each clean kind and five pairs of each unclean kind, uh, were present on the ark and taken care of by Noah and his family. There they are, tending the sauropods and the moose in adjacent cases. If you go to the um, museum, you can have your picture taken on this adorable little baby triceratops. Um, well, I'm not here to you know, talk about uh, creation science, although it's a wonderful topic. Uh, in my book, which you have been inflicted with, uh, there are lots of references, and the website talkorigins.org is a very good place to go for... Uh, um, scientific refutations of some of these creationist claims. But it is no uh, secret that the creation science and, to a large degree, the intelligent design proponents look at the creation and evolution controversy as a dichotomy. That there is either good guy Christian creationists or bad guy evolution atheists. The truth is actually more complicated. It is not a dichotomy, it is a continuum. And we're going to look at the continuum very quickly. There's much more information on this in your books. Um, the most extreme of the uh, creationists um, are the flat earthers, the individuals who do believe that the earth is, spheric, is not spherical, but circular, round like a coin. Uh, there's some Bible passages that you can uh, uh, pursue in the textbook. And people always say, oh, come on, there aren't really any flat earthers anymore. But here's the New York Times obituary for Charles Johnson, who was, in fact, the head of the Flat Earth International Flat Earth Research Association. Um, in addition to flat earthers, you have geocentrists, who are uh, a somewhat more numerous group of um, uh, biblical literalists. Marshall Hall is one example. Uh, he has published uh, a number of books, has an interesting website, uh, which you can visit. Uh, Russell Humphreys, who works for the Institute for Creation Research, Henry Morris's old shop, has what is not presented as a geocentric view, but in effect is, in the sense that he views the universe as this huge, huge sphere, which is surrounded by a thin layer of water, the water above the firmament, as it says in the Bible. And so the galaxies are all inside, and of course we are one of the galaxies that makes it more or less a geocentric universe. Now the reason for geocentrism or flat earthism is that these are the people who take the Bible to, to be the most literal uh, publication, and there are many passages which I repeat in, in my textbook um, describing what sources that they refer to. Most Christians obviously do not interpret the Bible this literally. But as Gerardus Buo, a very famous 20th century 
geocentrist wrote, if God cannot be taken literally when he writes of the rising of the sun, how can one insist that he be taken literally when writing of the rising of the sun? The idea that if Genesis is not correct, then revelations cannot be correct. You have to accept the whole Bible is literally truth. I mentioned the Young Earth Creationists, um, Henry Morris's followers. I won't, uh, the Institute for Creation Research and Answers in Genesis, I won't talk about them anymore. There also, excuse me, there also are old earth creationists. Old earth creationists are individuals who do interpret the Bible literally, particularly the, um, the creation of kinds of organisms. They do not accept evolution. They believe that the living things, plants and animals, form separately created kinds. But they do accept the evidence from science for an ancient Earth. Uh, they accept radiometric dating, radioisotopic dating. That's not a problem for them. It's, a, it's an attempt to try to keep as much of a literal interpretation of the Bible as possible, but still accept as much of modern science as possible. Uh, very popular old Earth creationist perspectives include the day-age theory, which is the idea that each day of the six days of Genesis is a very long period of time, which allows you to maintain more or less the sequence of Genesis creation, but allows time for an ancient Earth. The um, gap theory is a more of an 18th century view, not too many gap theorists around these days. That's the idea that there was a very, very long period of time in between Genesis verse 1 and Genesis verse 2, that there are two creation stories in the Bible. Progressive creationism is another uh, old earth view in which God creates more and more complicated organisms sequentially through time. In other words, the geological column really does reflect reality as opposed to how Noah's flood sorted animals, which is what you get from the uh, young earth creationists. It's fun stuff to read, it really is. Um, but the idea of, of progressive creationism is that God you know, creates sequentially through time. So there are a lot of old earth creationist views, but they all are special creation views in that God creates things pretty much as you see them today. He may not have created the mammals until the, you know, Cenozoic, but he created them like, like we see them today. Theistic evolution is a very common Christian view. It is actually the view that you will find if you went to a Catholic school. Theistic evolution is the idea that evolution happened, but it was the way God chose to bring the universe about. Um, there's been a lot of Catholic um, scholarship uh, on um, Catholicism and evolution, on Catholicism and science. Uh, this book, Catholicism and Science, was edited by my colleague, or was written by my colleague Peter Hess and a colleague of his. People keep sending me cartoons about theistic evolution, so I have to share them. I'm tired of making decisions. Let's just go with natural selection. Now, that's a quintessential theistic evolution cartoon. Um, for the physicists. You made it all out of quarks? Get out of here. <laughs> and because I am an anthropologist, I simply had to include this one. Instead of starting from scratch, why don't we just use modified chimp DNA? <laughs> the National Center for Science Education has a little book called Voices for Evolution, which you can get. And you can also go to our website and, and um, get all this information online. Uh, Voices for Evolution presents perspectives from scientists, educators, and religious denominations, basically saying evolution's okay with us, you know, it's how God did it. There's a lot of theistic evolution statements. And what many people don't realize is that evangelical Christians are also split on the issue of evolution. A website called the American Scientific Affiliation, ASA3.org, it's a very interesting website. It's a, the ASA is an old organization, dates back to the 40s, <laughs> like me. Um, and it is an organization of evangelical Christians in science. And most of them are theistic evolutionists, which comes as a real surprise to conservative Christian students. Last on the uh, continuum is materialists. Now. Materialism is the view that matter and energy, the material world, the material universe, is all there is. There is no God, 
There are no gods, there are no ancestor spirits, there's no supernatural, there is only, reality consists only of the matter and energy world that we are, universe that we are familiar with. A statement by Richard Dawkins, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. With which I agree completely, by the way, but. Um, this is a very classic statement of materialist philosophy. Now, I want to spend a little time on this idea of materialism because there are two ways that this word is used, and creationists often conflate the two, which creates a great deal of confusion in the understanding of evolution. In science, we talk about something called methodological materialism or methodological naturalism. This is that little rule that I mentioned, that we restrict ourselves to natural causes. And it's not because all scientists are atheists, because I showed you they weren't. We restrict ourselves to natural causes because it works. And because natural causes are the only kind we can control, that we can only hold constant. So we restrict ourselves to natural causes. We are methodological naturalists because it, it works. Why, why mess with a good thing? But also because it keeps us honest. You know, if we, are, if we allow ourselves, as the intelligent design proponents want us to do, to say, origin of life, man, that is a really, really, really tough problem. God did it. If we allow ourselves to do that and stop looking for a natural cause, we will never find it. That's only logical. So we set aside supernatural cause and just muddle along best we can with natural causes, and that's called methodological materialism. There's also philosophical materialism, which was that position on the uh, continuum that I showed you, uh, the, the view held by Richard Dawkins and some scientists, not all. The idea that matter and energy, that material uh, causes and phenomena is all the universe is composed of, that there is no supernatural. These are not the same. They are not contingent on one another. Although I'm sure all philosophical materialists are also methodological materialists, the converse does not hold. My favorite example would be Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel was a methodological materialist. He figured out the rules of heredity by using methodological naturalism, and he obviously was not a philosophical materialist, right? So one can be a methodological naturalist wearing one's scientist hat, so to speak, but one doesn't have to be one wearing one's religious or philosophical uh, position. I have long admired a colleague of uh, mine in, in anthropology who wrote an article a number of years ago in Discover Magazine kind of dealing with um, the Dawkins position, as it were, of the um, um, priority, uh, uh, primacy, I should say, of philosophical materialism. Um, he wrote, many scientists are atheists or agnostics who want to believe that the natural world they study is all there is. And being only human, they try to persuade themselves that science gives them grounds for that belief. It's an honorable belief, but it isn't a research finding. And I think the take-home point here from Matt Cartmill's article is that science may support philosophical or religious views, but science does not compel any particular philosophical or religious view. Can we take another look at those two columns that we looked at before and maybe add a third column here, materialism? Logical empirical evidence used, yep. Revelation, no. Mystical personal states of being, certainly not. But I shouldn't say certainly not. That may be up in the air, I don't know of any, but eh, maybe. Supernatural powers intervene, no. Belief in a non-material world, no. Belief in spiritual beliefs, beings, no. Materialism rejects all of those. Notice here in the previous comparison, in this comparison, in the next one, the differences are much more between religion and materialism than between religion and science. Belief in an afterlife? No. Concern with ethic, evil ethics and morals? Yes, because it's a philosophical view. Sense of awe, mystery, and the sacred? Yes, from nature, not from supernatural forces. I guess what I would like to present to you is something to contemplate. 
when you're thinking about the relation of science and religion and of methodological naturalism and philosophical naturalism, consider that science may indeed provide support for, it is used by Richard Dawkins to support atheist ideas. Science is also used by Francis Collins to support theistic ideas. This is empirically true. Science is used by both theists and atheists to support their points of view. Which side does a better job is something that you can certainly debate, and the theists and the atheists can have, you know, been arguing for a very long time. They will doubtless continue to do so. I would like to leave science out of it. I would like people to understand that science is a very important and useful way of knowing that is very rich in the ideas and the discoveries that it produces, has produced and will produce, and indeed, like any other strong cultural institution, will be seized by ideologues to promote their point of view, whether those are atheist ideologues or theistic ideologues. Science is an incredibly powerful cultural um, um, component, and it, science is drawn into these culture wars. I would like to try to discourage people from doing that, both non-believers like myself as well as believers, who are many friends of mine and people I work with. What I'd like people to do is understand that science doesn't compel Richard Dawkins' view, nor does it compel Francis Collins' view. It does not compel an atheistic view, nor does it compel a theistic point of view. It's a rich body of knowledge and information that people are going to use, but you know, don't, cl don't claim that science only supports your perspective. There are two general ways that science and religion can interact. The Henry Morris way, where religion determines the science. As Henry Morris says, the word of God must take first priority, priority and secondly, the observed facts of nature. Or the arrow can go the other way around, such as in uh, Jack Hott's uh, God After Darwin and many other publications of him, as well as many other Christian theologians, who view science as a source of insight for religion. These are most modern Christian theologians believe that a coherent theology must reflect what we know of the natural world. This is not a new idea. This, this occurred right after Darwin wrote on the origin of species. In fact, within a decade or so, the Anglican Church was writing things like, well, if indeed the scientists say that there was a long, long period of time before human beings came on the planet, that there was this long period of, of animal evolution before human beings showed up, then I guess we have to rethink the concept of original sin, because Adam and Eve could not have brought death into the world by sinning. Okay, so the idea that science can inform religion is a very powerful one and is very different from the relationship that religion determines science. Science, I think, can, can usefully correspond with religion. You've been very patient and I've gone a little bit longer than I should have. The National Center for Science Education is ncseweb.org and my colleagues, Eric Mickle, Susan Spath, Glenn Branch, Louise Mead, Peter Hess. Uh, Louise is our education outreach person. Peter is our faith outreach person. Josh Rosenau and I um, are trying to figure out the creation and evolution controversy and how to keep evolution in the schools. And we would encourage you to visit our site and even encourage you to join. And for the students, we even have a Facebook page. So there we are. We're up with the swells. And the old lady even has an avatar. So come and see us. Thank you so much for coming, for inviting me to be part of your class. Our first discussant is Professor Brent Sockness, Associate Professor and Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Department of Religious Studies here at Stanford. Brent holds his MA in Religious Studies and a PhD in Theology from the University of Chicago and specializes in modern Western religious thought. His current research interests focus on German post-Kantian Protestant, the Protestant theology and ethics in the 19th century. Protestant. Protestant. Easy for you Protestant. to say. Yeah, that's a good one. 
There are a lot of those in the United especially, States. <laughs> especially the work of 19th century philosopher, theologian, and humanist, Friedrich Schleiermacher, who had prophetic words to say on the subject of, um, of science and religion that I hope Brent will share. Brent has held fellowships from the German Academic Exchange Service, the American Academy in Berlin, the Stanford Humanities Center, and the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. He is chair of the Schleiermacher Group of the American Academy of Religion and vice president of the German Schleiermacher Gesellschaft. He also serves the de as the, um, the Department of Religious Studies undergraduate director as well as on the steering committees of the Stanford Program in Ethics and Society and Interdisciplinary Studies in the Humanities. Brent. Thank you very much. Um, there are all sorts of thoughts streaming through my mind. Thank you very much for that presentation and for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I'll try to be as coherent as I can. Um, and many of you, let me just start by saying many of you might be thinking, oh, this is one of those uh, uh, horse and pony shows where they bring up the scientist and then the advocate of, of religion or um, evangelical Christianity and they face off and, and, um, and you get entertained for 45 minutes or so or something like that. Uh, that's not the case. In fact, I agree um, uh, with much, if not uh, with, with perhaps most of, of what was said tonight uh, in terms of um, uh, the issue of the sort of uh, border skim uh, skirmishes and uh, this question about the, the proper realm and methodology of science and, and its relationship um, to religion. Uh, as was mentioned, um, my own training uh, is, uh, in fact, in Christian theology at a major divinity school. Uh, University of Chicago um, uh, is uh, historically a sort of bastion of uh, what was called around the turn of the 20th century as modernism. Uh, they were the folks uh, fighting already with the fundamentalists uh, in the teens and 20s. Um, but my training is in theology, and my specialty is, uh, you might say, the intellectual history of the Christian religion uh, in Europe, uh, particularly in the 18th and 19th century. So my broader perspective is one of somebody who has watched um, various outbreaks of debates between science and religion uh, over time, and that's the perspective from which I'm um, commenting tonight. Um, first, uh, I guess, a word about um, science and religion. I guess I'm in the, the nice position of now being able to complexify things uh, a bit since you've laid the groundwork. It's a great combination, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but um, I think to talk about science and religion um, as two um, sort of monolithic enterprises um, is, is a bit... Um, um, problematic and distorting. I mean, there is a scientific methodology, uh, an empirical scientific methodology um, that uh, arises through hypothesis and test testing and verification um, that most of the natural sciences share. Um, but it's nonetheless the case that there are, there are many sciences and those methodologies are themselves um, uh, um, at least at the, at the level of in individual disciplines uh, quite different. Likewise, the term religion, you went to pains to, um, to impress upon uh, the students that um, uh, the category of religion uh, shouldn't be thought of just in terms of the, the Jewish and the Christian traditions with which we're most familiar, um, but you actually set out a, a more anthropological definition that tried to be um, uh, more universal. Um, so the first thing I guess I, I want to point out is, is um, the culture, of, first of all, that, that both religion and science are cultural activities. They're, they're things human beings do, okay? Um, they're things human beings do, practice, believe, and so, so forth. Second, I want to talk about or just uh, um, point out the cultural specificity of this debate or of this um, recent skirmish between um, natural science and religion, and that is how peculiarly North American um, it is. Um, uh, you know, why is it um, that the debate about evolution and creationism takes place um, in North American culture um, and not uh, in another um, society 
whose uh, indigenous religion is Buddhism or Taoism or Hinduism. Um, why is it that the European uh, churches uh, took a different route uh, on many of these issues? That's, that's um, an interesting thing to think about. For instance, the, the German thinker that was mentioned that I study, Schleiermacher, and a whole host of uh, German theologians who were um, both university professors but often uh, served in church leadership per, uh, positions. Um, the question about uh, the literal interpretation of the Bible on the one hand and the autonomy of the sciences on the others were not the kind of, of hot button cultural issues in other societies that they are in North America. So I, I, I'm just inviting you to think about um, the cultural specific, specificity and, and peculiarity of this particular um, debate which is so part of our current culture wars. Um, just now on to some comments about the talk. Um, I was a little, little bit perplexed, and here I'm going to be um, critical, I was a little bit perplexed about the epistemology that was set out. Um, we were told that there are, there are three ways of knowing, science, personal insight, um, and the examples given there were hallucinatory drugs, and, and, um, and authority. Um, and of course, uh, within the context of a discussion of religion in the United States, that would be the authority of scripture. Um, I was, I was, I, I know that's an oversimplification, but I was left a little puzzled um, as to where the humanities, for instance, would fit into that schema. Um, that, that is, um, there are not only the natural sciences at Stanford, but there are also the social sciences, um, which often now pattern themselves at, after the natural sciences, but that's an old debate. Um, but there are the humanities, uh, in which uh, professors in all sorts of humanistic di disciplines studying literature, uh, various cultures, um, philosophy, uh, philosophy. Where is philosophy in the epistemology? That is, there are, there, are, there are whole fields of realms that, broadly speaking, we would call knowledge that, that don't fit into this, this uh, oversimplified um, epistemology. Okay? As somebody working in a religious studies department, um, we, uh, uh, scholars of religious studies, um, approach uh, religion first and foremost as a historical and cultural phenomena. Um, a phenomena that uh, comes to us through times uh, that involve complex symbol systems. Um, here, here would be my definition of religion, complex symbol systems, um, in which human beings uh, uh, um, construct a, a picture, an image of the way things are, and they use that picture image to orient themselves in life. So there's ethical components, uh, there are symbolic uh, components, um, but it's highly symbolic um, uh, activity. It involves rituals and practices as well as beliefs. I think, um, again, speaking as a religious studies scholar, in these debates about science and religion, we tend to over-intellectualize the religious side of things, okay, and understand that, that the, um, you might say the springs of religion are not always a matter of holding whether there's a God or not, or whether this non-material spirit exists or not. Those are all um, as if they're treating religious objects as if they're just another set of empirical, um, empirical objects or everyday objects, but of a super sensible or, or um, supernatural sort. That's not quite the way in which most scholars of religion think about religions as cultural phenomenon. Um, even if you think of uh, somebody like Clifford Gertz, who so famously uh, uh, wrote this essay called Religion as, as a Symbol System. So my perspective on, on religion and what people are doing uh, when they practice religion, when they sing hymns, when they, when they recite uh, the Psalms or the book of Genesis, um, it's less, I, th I think, cognitive than this, than this discussion uh, ton tonight um, uh, assumes, which is not to say that precisely where you are in the, in the, in the trenches, um, which is not to say that that's not where these discussions tend to be, precisely because, um, bless your soul, um, <laughs> It, you, you have made it um, um, your vocation, if I may use a religious uh, uh, word, to devote yourself professionally um, 
uh, to uh, these uh, debates and, and the, the uh, very practical orientation to exactly, these matters. Exactly, very practical <laughs> orientation. In any case, I'm getting the sign already, believe it or not, um, that it's time to wrap up and I can mop up um, in the Q&A anything that I've uh, begun to introduce here. Thanks. Thank you, Brent. Our second discussant is Professor Jeffrey Wine, Professor of Psychology, Human Biology, Neurosciences, and by courtesy, Pediatrics. Professor Wine served as the director of Stanford's well-known program in human biology from 2003 to 2006. He teaches a wide range of courses in cellular neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, brain and behavior, the human genome, the list goes on. Professor Wine heads the Cystic Fibrosis Research Laboratory, which carries out basic research on campus to ameliorate cystic fibrosis, the famous lung disease, which is a major cause of illness and death among CF patients. The lab has as its leading hypothesis that cystic fibrosis lungs will re retain near normal function if infections can be held at bay. From his work with human biology, with cystic fibrosis, and with much more, Jeff has a special perspective on evolution. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, I think you can tell from that introduction that uh, I'm a little bit of an outlier up here. I don't think that I can add to this discussion any more than any single one of you could add, and I'm going to try to turn it over to you as quickly as I can. Let me just say that I enjoyed uh, the presentation a great deal, and as always, uh, I enjoy being a student more than I be, uh, enjoy being a teacher. I, I learned a lot. Something that you said uh, is what I would like to, uh, w was going through my mind the whole time uh, you were speaking, and that is, why are we here? Why is it necessary to have this kind of conversation in the 21st century? Um, <laughs> So, so science uh, is, in fact, I, I would argue that science is, in fact, a monolithic discipline. Because whether you're an anthropologist or somebody pipetting, you have these fundamental tools that you were talking about. You have a fundamental process. And that process has brought forth unprecedented power. There's never been anything remotely like it. Science builds on itself continuously, continues to grow, and the result of that has been an unbelievable enrichment of material facts. So now, when we look at one another, we not only just see a person and their face, but we now know that you have a genome and a proteome. We know that there are billions of nerve cells in your brain, and we know a great deal about how they're interconnected and how they give rise to your mind. As a result of this, there is a ever-growing asymmetry between the information that the sciences bring to the table and the rather dusty and tired and repetitive uh, explanations uh, that have been brought forth by the alternate uh, approach to understanding the world. Given that, why is it, why is it that magical thinking is not diminishing in the United States? Some people think it is. Steven Weinberg uh, wrote an article recently in the New York Review of Books in which he felt that he's finding fewer and fewer people who have that outlook. But I don't see that, and I don't think the statistics bear that out, and I think your job would be a lot easier if that were true. So I ask this question uh, to everyone because I don't have an answer. But I do think an answer is important. Because by its definition, uh, faith is not susceptible to argument. That's, that's why we try to confine it, I think, to very personal spheres where it can serve people, can serve individuals in crucial ways. And if you talk to Francis Collins, he will tell you that he finds his faith enormously comforting and feel sorry for those of us 
who don't have that degree of comfort. And, and it's, a, it's a powerful argument. And I do sometimes envy him. But when faith comes outside of the personal sphere, when you have faith-based medicine or faith-based foreign policy or faith-based economics, then an appropriate, uh, <laughs> then I think uh, you can see the trouble that one gets into. That's, and that I'll conclude. Thank you. Th those of you who are. This will be available, I understand, on the internet. And those of you who are watching this sometime down the line may wonder why the chuckles. This is the day that the stock market fell over 700 points. And so hence the appreciative comment here. I, uh, I, I get asked two questions pretty regularly on you know, talk radio call-in shows. And one of them is, um, perhaps the most annoying, and that is, uh, if man evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? And you just sort of don't know where to begin with that one. But the second one is the question you asked, Brent, which is, why is, it, why is this happening here and not other places? And uh, I actually have an article that I wrote which gives my uh, ideas as to why this may be the case, um, published in Cell in the... January, February 2006 or something. Um, you can find it if you Google me in Cell, because that's the only article I ever wrote in Cell, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. What is a physical anthropologist doing publishing in Cell anyway? But um, And it, just to make a very long story short, it has to do with history, um, in my opinion. The, the fact that we have a particularly conservative form of Christianity in the United States. Uh, fundamentalism, after all, was invented here. Uh, the 12 fundamentals were written between, what, 1912 and about 1918, something like that. And that formed the basis for this new American Protestantism called fundamentalism, which uh, really didn't take root in Europe. I mean, this is pre we, we think of Christianity as being this, you know, biblically literist kind of, well, not obviously all, we hopefully, we have a little more sophisticated view, but many of us look at Christianity as being this uh, biblically literalist kind of perspective, which is really not the case at all. It's, it's a minority when it comes to world uh, Christianity. Uh, that said, um, in parts of the world where um, uh, conservative Christians have been very active in evangelizing, um, where you're getting the growth of these more conservative forms of Christianity, such as Latin America, Central America, uh, Africa. Uh, you are finding more uh, anti-evolutionism as well. Um, the former Soviet Union republics uh, and the Soviet Union, Union itself uh, is having something of a religious revival. And the in the Soviet Union, it's not quite so much in the last two or three years, but previously there was a lot of missionizing um, by conservative Christians. So uh, we, we may be seeing more anti-evolution uh, outside the United States, but you know, like so many things, history and culture explain so much of what's going on here. And I will, I will be the first to admit that uh, I was dealing with very general principles. And uh, it, it's really nice to have a, an opportunity to, to follow up with a little bit more detail. And I, We're eager to take questions from yeah. the audience, so please help yourselves to the mics. And let's ask some of those good questions you've all been waiting to ask. Sir. All right, so my question has to do with uh, the burden of proof in terms of a non-material reality. And uh, it seems to me if there's a non-material reality that has influence on the material reality through such as a meddling God in our human affairs, then it seems that the burden of proof is on the theists and the non-materialists. And if this is the case, then we can realize it. So I think something that uh, Dr. Scott mentioned in her talk where uh, it's beyond our capability to understand is actually false, um, but we can realize it if not understand it. And if there is a non-material reality where the gods are not meddling in our affairs, it seems like the only way we're ever going to arrive at an, uh, a consensus about God is through logic, not through butting heads. 
And so either way, in the worst case for materialists, it seems like the debate is woefully unsettled by the non-materialists. And so what's your take on that? <laughs> <laughs> there was a question. <laughs> no, I, yeah, it's fine, no. Um, Again, I, I would just refer you to the many, many forms that religious belief can take, even within Christianity. Um, I know conservative Christians who are absolutely certain there is a God because they have experienced God. Now, that's not going to be persuasive to me as a materialist. I have not experienced God in the sense that they have. They have. It, it is really a physiological reaction that they describe, this feeling of oneness with God. I've never experienced that. It's not persuasive to me. As a materialist, as a, as a humanist, I would probably look for a different explanation you know, I would probably look for a physiological explanation, you know, for, for that feeling that that person experienced that they are interpreting as being touched by God. Um, there are others, uh, other Christians who, who don't believe God interferes with the natural world, who believe for theological reasons God should not be, there should be an economy of miracles, as they refer to it in theolo theological circles, that they don't want God, dis a miracle being defined as, as a breaking of God's created law, so to speak, like rising from the dead and so forth, that there should be an absolute minimum of that because more for theological reasons than, than for anything else, and you know we don't really have time to go into them. But it has to do with um, the responsibility humans have to God to obey God. If God is sort of playing dice out there, it's very difficult to live in a contingent universe and know what God wants. So therefore, God doesn't interfere. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of theology out there. Um, and it's very difficult to take any one um, attack, like Dawkins' attack, and, and which you summarized very nicely, I think, and you know, claim that this will, will take care of all religious beliefs. So you know, af after having spent an hour really simplifying things for you, my reaction is, it's a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to make a comment about that and put on my, my theological hat, if I may use that T word in this audience. Um, I'm concerned about dichotomizations. Um, the the idea um, the idea that there are scientifically minded people, and that there and that the only um, perspective from which to address the God question might be a personal experience or a divine revelation. The question of God um, throughout Western history has not been a matter of empirical science, nor has it always. Uh, uh, indeed, for most of its history, been left up to faith as a, as a matter of blind leap. The question of God in the Western philosophical tradition has always been a metaphysical question. Hmm. And metaphysics has a different lo logic to it than empirical scientific questions. So you can even find today philosophers who aren't themselves particularly pious Christians who debate the question of the reality of God. Mm -hmm. Okay, So what I would like to, I guess my big contribution to this discussion is to fill in some of this huge gap in the center that, that stands between um, s scientific logic and rationality, or scientism, to put, if it's philosophical scientism we're talking about, a philosophical position, and the notion that the, the, the alternative to that is, the de facto alternative is just uh, a faith understood as, as a sort of uh, a leap into the unknown or uh, a hallucination or some other um, supernatural, uh, or, or a supernatural uh, revelation. Just, just like the cutting up the pie of epistemology is, is too simple when it's, when it's a matter of personal insight, okay, we all have all sorts of personal insights uh, daily um, that guide our lives, uh, it's, 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 it's more complicated than that, science as a monolith, and then authority, okay, which we moderns you know, rebel against. Um, I think all of the, interest, the, the intellectually interesting debates about the science and religion question, about creation and evolution, if there is a debate to be had there, they, not the politically interesting ones, which is where you're, that's where you are in the trenches, but the, the, the intellectually interesting ones are in the philosophy of science on the one hand, 
And there are philosophy of science courses and history of science courses students should and ought to take here at Stanford. Uh, and in fact, after teaching here for about seven or eight years, uh, myself in religious studies, I can, I can remember coming to this realization. Boy, if only Stanford students would take a philosophy of science <laughs> course before they came to the religious studies department. Okay? Wouldn't that be nice? Okay? So th the real issues, where the issue gets joined in a serious debate and conversation is in philosophy of science okay, and philosophy of religion. Okay? There's one thing religious studies scholars don't agree about one wit, and many of them have given up even trying to do it, and that is the theory of religion. Okay? What is religion? Okay? <laughs> they have given up the idea that we can give a definition that covers all cases, many if not, if, if not most. So contentious is it that it forms one of the, the backbones of our whole discipline. Okay. But one reason why I try to do that is to get people away from this dichotomy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Dan Dennett's going to come and, and talk, and he's, his views are very different. From, I probably agree philosophically with Dan Dennett on reality. You know, when neither of us believe in God, we're both materialists. But his views on religion are very, very different from mine. Uh, and I think, in, in many ways, his views are really too narrow, which is why I'm casting a much broader mm -hmm. net. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question. For the other side. Uh, you were next, and then we'll go to the All other right, side. All right, fine. I like to look at the whole sweep of human history. And uh, scientists actually deal with empirical evidence. And if you look at the period of time that uh, humans existed, even without a voice, uh, our voice, uh, at least the genetic material uh, uh, change in our voice box, uh, uh, is dated at least between 60 and 100,000 years ago. 60,000 to 100,000 years ago. We existed with our five senses the way they are, without, that is, naked five senses, to be able to acquire our empirical evidence for a very long time. And if you look at the accumulation of evidence in modern science, it had to wait until we could extend our five senses beyond the natural uh, limitations. Um, there was a time with the ancient Greeks when we had a start at using our philosophy and our uh, abilities in mathematics and, and logic. But modern religions, uh, Christian religions in the West in particular, threw a blanket over that kind of, uh, of inform information gathering. And it was the propensity of religion and the accumulation of power until the Middle Ages, and we eventually got around to having the religious wars that did that, you know, did some destruction or construction at that point. But I'd like all of you to think, and I, I have thought about this a long time, that we have scientific thinking and we have mythological thinking. Seems to me that mythological thinking is a result of not having empirical evidence to answer the questions that we, that we have to uh, have empirical evidence for, for knowledge about them. So our five, sen our five senses were able to collect empirical evidence up until uh, of all of the practical things we do. But when we go beyond our five senses, we, or, or when we need uh, um, additional information to have empirical evidence that go belong beyond our five senses that are limited, that's when we have modern science and that's when the god of the gaps begin to disappear and that's where we are at the present time, trying to trying to see the difference between mythological thinking and scientific thinking. And so the question Thank is... You. Oh. <laughs> well, the question is, have you thought about this, uh, this, this uh, model, and does it ring true to any one of you? It doesn't ring, it doesn't ring completely true to me because I don't think there is this sharp dichotomy between what you call mythic, or I would maybe call myth, you call it mythological, I would think of it as mythic 
thinking versus uh, empirically empiric thinking, because all you you know all societies of human beings use a mixture. Um, if you are a Brazilian rainforest Indian, you know that the wind blew the roof off your house. Okay, that's empirically obvious. The wind came, it blew the roof off the house. But what's important is who sent the wind, and it was one of the witches from the next village. So you know, you have you have a combination of both empirical thinking, observational. Uh, we couldn't survive as organisms on the planet if we weren't able to take in information from our environment. So that goes back, you know, to early hominids. Um, and I think I think the mythic kinds of thinking gives meaning to, to uh, lives and culture. And uh, you know, in, in anthropology, the word myth is not a pejorative, you know, because myths are actually more important than science. I mean, in the anthropological sense, a myth is an idea that encapsulates something that's very important to a culture. And uh, they are transmitted usually um, by oral culture, but you know, even in the United States, uh, in Western culture, we have our own myths, which we, you know, Horatio Alger is a myth, believe me. <laughs> anyway. Next question here. Speak up, it'll come up. They'll bring it up. Okay. Uh, Dr. Scott, at the end of your talk, you, when you were talking about trying to just basically keep science out of the argument, I think that's kind of where you were going. You said science does not compel atheism. I don't really get how that works. It seems like science does compel atheism. The important thing is the verb. It's compel atheism. Um, if you look at science the way I look at it, which is as a limited way of knowing, we're stuck with methodological naturalism. It's the only kind of explanations we can use are natural ones because those are the only ones we can test. If that's the case, then we have to leave the supernatural aside if we're evaluating something scientifically. You know, just like we can say to Henry Morris, you can't say science, um, you know, proves there is a God or, um, you know, uh, proves that the earth was created in six days. Um, we also can't say that science proves there is no God. I, I should I should make something clear because uh, I think I might have just been confusing there, and I don't mean to be. When a religious view makes a fact claim, like Grand Canyon was laid down by Noah's flood, that is a fact claim. You're on science's turf, and we can refute that religious claim. If somebody makes the claim that well, all those layers in the Grand Canyon, four thousand feet of strata. Um, really just were laid down by God just to make it look like it's very ancient. That's not a scientific statement. You can't test that because any supernatural, any omnipotent supernatural force can do anything you want. There, there is no outcome of a test that it's incompatible with the actions of a supernatural force, so you just have to leave it out. Now, as a materialist, I find those kinds of explanations very unrewarding. I much prefer a scientific explanation, but I also understand that you know, nobody really, nobody really believes in God because they want to know how Grand Canyon was formed, right? I mean, religion has a whole lot more uh, uh, roles to play than explaining the natural world. But if you want to explain the natural world, we win. You know, science is really the way to do it. Uh, beats revelation all the heck. Over here now. Uh, Dr. Scott, I wonder if you could address two points of what I perceive to be points of tension between science and religion. One is common ancestry and the, the other is origin of life. With respect to common ancestry, uh, at least in common parlance, I haven't read too much since I've only on, on the second lesson here, common ancestry seems to mean single ancestry or, or a single organism, which is the common ancestor. I think Professor Durham in his introduction actually used that phrase. However, last week we had uh, Lynn Rothschild, I believe was her name, who was positing that perhaps in as many as 300 or almost 300 places in the universe, the conditions were sufficient to support life. And if conditions in other parts of the universe are sufficient to cause life, why couldn't there have been more than one place on Earth, which is quite hospitable to, to life, which may have provided the environments for multiple ancestors, so to speak, for multiple branches of life. 
Now, in addition to Lynn Rothschild, Darwin himself, in the assigned readings for last week, I believe it was chapter seven talking about difficulties, alluded to that possibility, at least by analogy, where he was talking about electric fish and how there were very distinct species of electric fish which might not have a common ancestor. And he complicated the argument by pointing out that there were luminescent insects which were even more difficult to justify as having a common ancestor. And he argued that, in fact, because of the special environmental circumstances of each of these species, perhaps natural selection worked independently to create this electric or luminescent capability. And he analogized that to scientists who make similar inventions at about the same time when the scientific environment was favorable. So by analogy, because you have common features, uh, not, uh, common features do not require or imply a common ancestor, isn't it possible that various living things, because of their common feature of life, do not necessarily imply a common single ancestor? Second question, which is related no, to... No, one question. <laughs> one, one, one to a customer. We're now at five minutes to, to go, so we have to keep it short. You want to take that one first, Jean? Sure. Um, caveat. Um, Darwin was a great guy, but we know so much more about evolution today than he did that he's an interesting historical character. He had some wonderful insights, but we're not Darwinists. We're evolutionary biologists. We've gone well beyond. Um, Darwin would have loved Evo Devo, which kind of handles some of those things like luminescence occurring in very different uh, uh, um, lineages. Um, the, the question, though, was the origin of life and whether there's a single origin of life. Um, well, the origin of life actually was a separate related point, but I haven't what, Well, it. whether all living things come back to a single organism. Wouldn't matter, I don't think. Well, theologically, um, it could make a big difference, which is why I'm did saying Did you say attention. theologically? Theologically, yes. You're talking about I don't religion see why not. Science. I mean, if, if there's a God, he could create any number of ways. I mean, God wouldn't have to have a thing well, that I, just I created will, once. Well, I will defer Goodness. to the theologian at the table, but I, I thought that s one of the problems was else. that... So would the implication then <laughs> yes. be that if we if we descended from a number of different soupy little... No, no, I, no what I'm saying is the lineage of humans might be different than the lineage of fish. Oh, no. No, by the time you get to... to to, uh, creatures like humans and fish, you're dealing with common ancestry. The only reason you would question um, the, uh, the concept of common ancestry is when you get way, 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 way down there at the root of the three domains. Uh, humans and fish belong to the group called eukaryotes. They're You've seen one eukaryote, you've seen them all. Eukaryotes are, that's a real knee slapper for, for biologists. Um, eukaryotes are, are every creature on the planet that has nucleated cells. So that's plants, that's animals, that's most of what you're familiar with. All eukaryotes have a common ancestor. Nobody's going to argue about that at all. Now, way down, and you've got eukaryotes, archaea, and um, bacteria, varmints, uh, prokaryotes, uh, no nucleus. Way down at the root of those three domains, and these are all single-celled organisms at the root, there was probably a lot of genetic swapping around, which makes it probably impossible to find that, my, metatar, my metacarpal here, probably impossible to find a single organism or recreate or hypothesize about a single organism that was the first replicating creature. Because there was all this genetic swapping down here um, at the root of the three main domains. But once you get eukaryotes, you've got common ancestry. Because all eukaryotes are made on the same sort of biochemical plan, so to speak. But Jeannie, and, and go Darwin back a little. Know any of that, which go is back a little crazy. further and ask yeah. if you go back into that soup. Do you believe that there was one replicating molecule from which all there's a descendant, or do you think there were multiple? Or could could, could well have been multiple, but natural selection operates as soon as you've got replication, mm -hmm. and you have you know, and the definition of, of of life, which by the way is harder than you think. Mm -hmm. You know, defining what life is is not easy. Uh, and people who are, do research in origin of life, you know, at this end we've got replicating structures in a nucleus. Okay, that's definitely alive. What if you've got replicating structures that aren't in a nucleus? Is that life? Eh, it's kind of iffy. And you can work on all sorts of these, in it, and you've got organic molecules that aren't anything, and so that's definitely not life, and you've got a lot of iffy stuff in between. So, you know, whether there was one 
um, uh, or probably a multiple of replicating structures back there in the very early Archaean. And one of them just happened to be better at it than others, and we're all descended from it. That's possible. Can I, big, can I just add a, a theological deal. point, and it has to do with the logic of the sort of argument I think that was trying to be made, and that is to say, let's say even we could, even if we could put a sort of placeholder there for, for God, for a divine intervention, mm -hmm. um, the presumption in most of these debates seem to be that the God that you'd have there is the God of Christianity, and not Zeus, or, <laughs> yeah. or, or some supernatural power we know not what. There, there's no logical link between yeah, remember the goldfish Be between that, that first uh, super, supernaturally caused spark of life and the, the God of the Bible. And that seems to me to be a very difficult theological argument to make, unless, of course, you're just trying to look for um, a way in which your view of the Bible and biblical authority and, and the Christian tradition can be compatible with the scientific, mm -hmm. with the scientific view. But I, I, I don't think it's very good science. And in that respect, I, I concur uh, entirely with Dr. Scott this evening. So it's time we wrap up. Um, panelists, and I'm do you agreed have, with, yes. <laughs> do this you has have been a lot of fun. A concluding <laughs> remark, any of you? Nah. <laughs> I think, I think you have a wonderful already. class. Uh, th this, this is going to be a great 10 weeks. Jeff? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Don't forget. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at Stanford.